Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 245 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today's episode is talking about gut health and how gut health can impact skin health. I know, I know, I know we've talked about this a lot, but this conversation not only was really fun to have, but we touched on a lot of topics that I haven't yet talked about on the show, and I think that you will love it. So if you are interested in gut health and how it's connected to your skin, this episode is for you. My guest today is Dr. Will Bolsowitz otherwise known as Dr. B. He is an award-winning gastroenterologist, internationally recognized gut health expert, and the New York Times best-selling author of Fiber Fueled and the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. He sits on the scientific advisory board of Zoe, has authored more than 20 articles published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, has given more than 40 presentations at national meetings, presented to Congress and the USDA, and has taught over 10,000 students how to heal and optimize their gut health. He lives in Charleston, South Carolina with his wife and children, and you can find him on Instagram at thegutheathmd, as well as his website, theplantfedgut.com. Our conversation went a little long today, but I didn't want to splice and dice this conversation into multiple episodes. So bear with me. I think you'll love it. I had so much fun and I'm excited to share this with you. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. B. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited and honestly honored to have you here at the Healthy Skin Show. Ah, Jen, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I'm excited to talk about gut, gut health, gut skin. Let's get into it. You have a really amazing book that you wrote. Uh, When did the first book come out? Uh, so Fiber Fueled was my first book. It was a passion project. I wrote it at five in the morning uh, while <laughs> working as a doctor and taking call every third night. And it came out in May of 2020. And um, it was a New York Times bestseller. And I'm very, <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen. Could have sold 100 copies with 90 of them being my mom. But uh, here we are and we've sold 200,000 copies. It's been crazy. Oh my gosh. And it's been it's been inspiring for a lot of people no matter where they are i think on the dietary spectrum with the idea and which i can appreciate and very much resonates with me of just adding in as you can more plant foods which i think can benefit a lot of people um and you have this new cookbook coming out we're going to talk about that but i was sharing with you ahead of time that one thing that i found so refreshing about this book and why I wanted to have you here. So everybody listening, I actually think that the information in the book as a clinical nutritionist was so incredibly interesting. It wasn't just focused on here's a way to demonize certain foods and and scare you into not eating certain things. If anything, it was packed full of really tasty morsels of information that we're gonna talk about today that I was like, whoa, we can talk about short chain fatty acids and butyrate. Like you went into all of these topics that oftentimes are ignored in, especially in cookbooks. Like you, you like, I really commend you for that. You did a great job. Um, and it was interesting for me to read and this is what I do. <laughs> so, I would hope so. With- I mean, you know, I would hope so. I mean, I, I think that, um, at the end of the day, science, like when science is, about something that can transform our health and create um, uh, actionable tips that we can take and implement in our own life that are actually doable and sustainable. Something that we could just work into a healthy habit. When we have stuff like that, like science is sexy. How could it not be? It is. I know. And it's so helpful because it, yeah, and it informs you of choices that may be more helpful for you based on whatever it is that you have going on, which I think is so great. Cause it's like, we're not necessarily just like throwing a dart in the dark and taking a guess to see if something's gonna work. Instead we're saying, okay, there's the actual research to show that this may be beneficial and let me test it out on myself and see how I do, which I really, really love. So um, I wanted to start off this conversation 
about because your your whole thing is kind of based around fiber and this concept of adding in fiber and increasing fiber. So let's talk first about why fiber in general is important. And we're not talking, by the way, and you mentioned this in your book, Dr. V, about like grandma's orange fiber drink that all of us are like totally grossed out. I don't know if that's an age specific thing, but I we do remember like on this. Yes. Yeah, we may be dating ourselves, but I do remember, I think my grandmother <laughs> used Stirring to that drink, drink that. so she can have that bowel movement. Yeah, not so good. So what is the deal with fiber and why would you say maybe a few of the top reasons why you find fiber to be so important, especially as, as your you know background of being a gastroenterologist? All right, so as, as a frame of context, as we move into this conversation, I just wanna set the stage by saying that fiber is probably our most severe nutritional deficiency, which is part of the reason why I've made it a centerpiece of this conversation that I wanna have with um, the American public, the Western world. If I walk out on the street right now, and I find a random sample of 20 Americans, 19 out of 20 are deficient in fiber. And not like mildly deficient, but like severely deficient. The recommended amount for a man is 38 grams of fiber. The average man is getting like 18 grams. It's less than half wow. of the recommended amount. Now, women aren't doing that much better. The recommended amount for a woman is 25 grams, and the average woman is getting like 16 grams. So it's still pretty far away. And so here's this deficiency. And if I'm gonna answer your question, what's special about fiber? I'm gonna cut straight to the chase and say short chain fatty acids. But let me fill in the gaps here. Fiber doesn't just go in the mouth and pass through and come out the other end. That's the story we've been told. And it's, I mean, it's partially true, but that's not the, the exciting part. The exciting part is that we as humans, as sort of like powerful and egotistical about ourselves as we are, you know, we're like the apex predators in the world. As much as we think we're great, we actually lack the enzymes to process and digest fiber. But a single cellular bacteria that we can't even see with the naked eye could have hundreds of enzymes to break down and process fiber. And when you take our gut microbiome, which is the community that lives inside of our colon, our large intestine, there are 38 trillion of these types of microbes and they have this massive functional ability among this pool working together as a team to break down and process fiber for us. Because we lack the enzymes, fiber passes through our small intestine, which is 15 to 20 feet long, and it arrives in the colon intact, unchanged from the way that it was when it went in your mouth. And that's where the microbes get into a feeding frenzy and they consume it and they break it down this becomes their food, which is another way of saying fiber is a prebiotic, P-R-E. Fiber is a prebiotic, and you are enriching them. They grow stronger as a result of it. They become more capable of doing their job, and I'm sure your listeners have heard others talk about the gut microbiome before, but just in case, yes. their job is to support human health, which includes your digestion, your immune system, your metabolism, your hormones, your mood, your brain health, and they even have the capacity to manipulate your genetic code, which is kind of insane if you think about it. So, wow. yeah, it's true. We could talk about celiac disease on because on, obviously there's dermatologic implications with celiac disease, mm -hmm. too. So <clears throat> nonetheless, fiber becomes their food. They grow stronger. They become more capable of doing their job. And what they do is they turn around and they reward you in spades. Like you are getting way more back from them than you have given to them. And that is that they turn the fiber, it stops being fiber and it becomes short chain fatty acids, butyrate, acetate, propionate. Now these short chain fatty acids, like they have healing effects throughout the entire body. It is believed that they have healing effects in the skin. That's one of the locations. We know that they have healing effects in the brain. They affect our immune system, help to shape it. They affect our metabolism. They affect uh, right there in our colon. They help to repair and reverse leaky gut. I've been studying medicine for 20 years. These are the most healing, most anti-inflammatory compounds I have ever come across. And the problem is that 
19 out of 20 people are not eating fiber. And for us to get these healing anti-inflammatory compounds, we have to actually consume it. So recognizing that we have this massive fiber deficiency in our society and recognizing that the most healing thing I've ever come across comes from fiber, I say to myself, why is this not on the news on a nightly basis? And we can all create our conspiracy theories or whatever you want to call them about why that might be. Maybe the journalists, they're just not really good at identifying these issues. But you know what? Guess what? Neither are the doctors. The doctors aren't talking about it either. So it's time for us to start talking about this. This episode is brought to you by my skincare line, Dermaquel. The beauty of these skincare products are that they are especially crafted for those struggling with chronic skin rash issues based on my research and clinical experience from my private practice. They focus on organic ingredients that are clean like zinc, aloe, and hemp oil that support and calm rashed, dry, angry skin. There's no unnecessary chemicals or additives that can further dry out your skin or mess with your hormones. And I'm so excited for you to add these creams into your routine. Check them out at quellshop.com and use the coupon code GET15OFF to get 15% off your first order. I'll put a link in the description below. And now let's jump back to the video. Can I just ask, just the, you had this background as a doctor. My dad was a doctor and he had shared with me before he retired and then subsequently passed away that he felt like there was a lot of things that medicine does great. We can manage diseases to some degree, but it seems like it takes forever to move things forward. Like it takes a long time for the, like this is a, in the sense, almost a novel idea of fiber as being a deficiency. I mean, to be honest with you, even as a clinical nutritionist, this is the first time I've ever even heard someone say, we have a fiber deficiency. And you know what? Like I talk a lot about, we have, we don't eat enough uh, protein and getting enough amino acids, but this is another really valuable perspective on why increasing fiber would be beneficial because it is a deficiency. And I think it's important for people to realize we can't make, like your body can't make those short chain fatty acids if you don't consume the fiber. Like it's, it's, it's a necessity, right? Right. right. It's trying, to, it's trying to cook without ingredients. You need the ingredients exactly, in order to cook a meal. Right? Exactly. And, and I do want to just say too, there is research that I've seen where we're looking at um, the benefits even for the skin and there and I think to some degree it's not entirely clear but that you know and we've talked about this a little bit on the healthy skin show before how like butyrate for example may be almost like a sig signaling module to that starts in the gut and may ultimately end up having some impacts on even skin barrier function as well well um, we know we know it repairs the gut barrier for sure mm -hmm. all right there's um the the gut barrier has these tight junction proteins that keep the cells together and when we get leaky gut, that's because those tight junction bro proteins have broken down. And then we actually know that butyrate is the molecule that actually repairs them and restores them so that you can restore gut barrier function. We also know, um, Jen, that uh, there are people who have brain fog and their doctor rolls their eyes like, oh, brain fog, that doesn't even exist. What are you talking about? Of course it exists. You're experiencing it. You're not making stuff up. You don't want to be unwell. And what is brain fog? Brain fog is leaky brain. We have the same tight junction proteins in our brain, and we ha our blood-brain barrier has a very similar uh, uh, anatomical arrangement to the gut barrier. And guess what? Butyrate repairs those tight junction proteins. So it would stand to reason, wow. yeah. So it would stand to reason that that butyrate can have these healing anti-inflammatory effects. You know, uh, so this may be part of the story that connects the gut to the skin is butyrate having its effect on barrier function. And the other thing being that we know that skin disorders, many of them come from an inflammatory origin. Mm -hmm. And we know that butyrate is actually quite powerful at helping to regulate and balance our immune system. And you mentioned in the book, there are certain types of bacteria that in the GI tract that produce butyrate. So because um, somebody might be hearing this and going, oh, well, I, I heard or saw a supplement for butyrate. And while that may be helpful for some individuals, and sometimes I do use that in clinical practice, 
I think that we should realize that we want to, we want our body to do what it's supposed to do. And part of our body in a sense is this intricate relationship with these bacteria that live in it. So what type of bacteria would be butyrate producers, so to speak? And do you think it's worthwhile to supplement with butyrate or would your preference be to try to encourage your microbiome to produce the butyrate on its own? Well, I mean, we, so here's what I would say. First of all, I do believe that supplements have uh, value. And so I am not here to um, categorically dismiss supplements. I think pretty much everyone takes them. I love it when people like dis supplements and then you discover that there are, they're taking multiple supplements themselves. Like, come on. So, um, but let's start also with an honest assessment of this, which is that humans have existed for about 3 million years. So it's 3 million years of evolution. And I can assure you that during those 3 million years, um, there was never a single moment in human history that did not involve these microbes. This is a relationship that was galvanized through co-evolution. This is why we lean on them so much because we clearly through evolutionary processes grew to trust them. We discovered that they were more capable at doing certain things for us than we were capable of doing it ourselves. Butyrate supplements did not exist until the last couple of years. So we really don't know like whether or not the effect can be reproduced of what these 3 million years of co-evolution basically have gifted us, which is that when you consume dietary fiber, you support a healthy gut microbiome and those gut microbes will then turn around and produce the short chain fatty acids. We, we, we just simply don't know if taking a butyrate supplement is a shortcut that allows us to bypass that process and achieve similar results. I do think that there are people who have complex digestive disorders and they need something to help them to get to a better place. And it is not intended to be a replacement for dietary fiber, mm -hmm. but in some cases does allow them to achieve a healing effect that their body is not quite capable of doing on its own yet and get to a place where then they don't, they no longer actually need the butyrate supplement, but in the beginning there may be a place for it. So I do think that there's a place for it. Unfortunately, I, we haven't really done good studies to say, like I haven't seen any human trials with it to say that it actually works. So at the moment, it's a bit of an assumption to say that it does. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the bacteria that would be producing it, because um, I, I, my preference is always, could we get your body? And when I say body, I'm going to include the gut microbiome. Could we get the body to actually do what it's supposed to do? So what, and that's my preference. Uh, you know, I know some people are like, well, let's just take a supplement. That's not, like you said, it's not ideal. And that is a good point. There's some things that case by case, it, it does matter. Um, but when we're looking for butyrate producers, like what type of bacteria, like people are doing more stool tests this, these days. So people are spending money on stool tests that frankly I've talked about, they shouldn't be buying because it's a waste of money. Some that can be helpful, um, but like, is it a lot of bacteria that we're familiar with? I think a lot oh, yeah. of people don't realize they have these like crazy names. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's many of them. these short chain fatty acids. Well, you know, part of it um, that's kind of interesting is that the gut, we've, e we are evolving in our understanding because this is such a complex um, thing that we frankly discovered around 2006. And we, we uh, didn't have the tools prior to 2006, the laboratory tools that we needed to actually study the gut microbiome, which is why it was largely ignored. Um, and then suddenly we discovered it and we opened our eyes and we go, oh my gosh, we just discovered a new organ, right? Mm -hmm. And this organ is like completely intertwined with all these critical elements of human health. And it's not even human. And it's not even a part of our body. It's just like these foreign microbes that are living with us, but they're symbiotic and they're trying to help us. They're like there to help. And one of the things that's interesting about the microbiome is like in the very beginning, it was about identifying specific microbes. This microbe does this, that microbe does that. But then as we've evolved, we've come to a different place where now it's about what is the functional ability of your gut microbiome? Because there's redundancy. Different microbes can repeat and do the same thing that another microbe can, but at the end of the day, is your microbiome capable of doing the job that we're asking it to do? 
So some of the examples of, of microbes like Roseberia, Roseberia is, a, is a one that you'll see all over the case, all over the place, Fecal bacterium prosnitzii, um, multiple species of bifidobacteria, uh, multiple species of lactobacilli. So there are a whole bunch. I, mean, I don't even know how many there are in terms of species that can produce butyrate. It's at least dozens. But the point though, is that if you're not feeding those species fiber, then they're starving. Mm -hmm. And if they're starving, then like they're not really well represented in your microbiome. Yeah. And they're also not capable of doing their job. I mean, I'm not very good at my job when I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> well, you bring up a good point because uh, I feel like clients will come to me and say, oh, well, I have heard that I shouldn't. So a weird conversation that I have with some people is when we look at stool testing, I'm like, so there's a lot of depletion. Your diet is really limited. I know, but let's increase FODMAPs. So those fermentable starches that are found in a lot of different foods, like asparagus and avocado and figs and berries and all sorts of stuff. And they're like, what? I heard that FODMAPs are bad for you. And I'm like, Excuse me. I feel like FODMAPs have gotten a really bad rap. So what's your take on FODMAPs? Like, let's just like put it to bed right here. <laughs> it's, it's actually not even a controversial topic. I mean, the science is actually completely clear on this. The problem is that unfortunately, if a person doesn't really have a complete understanding or the ability to, to educate with a complete understanding on the topic, they paint with very broad strokes that are not actually accurate. FODMAPs, when you look at them, so FODMAPs are... Um, carbohydrates could be single sugar, could be chains of sugars put together. Lactose is the FODMAP that many people know. You find that in dairy products. But you also find, you know, uh, fructose in fruit. You'll find fructans, which are almost like fiber in garlic, onions, uh, wheat. You'll find galactans in legumes. And so these FODMAPs, when our gut is struggling to process and digest, they can you know, our gut can struggle with these foods and it can cause discomfort or gas and bloating, things like this. It makes it sound like they're bad, but actually if you go down the line, almost all the FODMAPs are prebiotic, meaning they are food for the gut microbiome. And this is the reason why when people do a low FODMAP diet, the low FODMAP diet originates out of Monash University in Australia. And they have never meant this to be a restrictive diet, ever. It was never meant to be that. They never taught it that way. It's the, mis in, the misinterpretation that takes place on the internet in echo chambers. And if you actually look at the way that the FODMAP diet is meant to be done, it's about taking one step backwards so that you can take 10 steps forwards. You do a temporary restriction so that you can understand whether or not you have an intolerance of FODMAPs. And once you identify that you have an intolerance, it's not about eliminating the food because that actually harms the gut. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's about building up tolerance and restoring function and making the gut more capable of processing and digesting FODMAPs because they're actually really good for us. FODMAPs are actually really good for us. So we want the FODMAPs, we just want them in the right amount and we want to train our gut, make it stronger and make it capable of processing these foods for us. So yes, everyone, if you're struggling with FODMAPs now, you can reintroduce them. I have seen it happen with clients. I'm sure Dr. B has seen that in patients and his book actually talks a lot about how you can kind of do that. He's got a whole process in there, but you can. So if you have had this mindset that FODMAPs are bad, which unfortunately like in the skin rash world, there's so many different diets that eliminate so many different things that food fear is a really serious problem. And so, you know, and it happens in gut issues, autoimmunity. I mean, we see it in many different worlds. I just know in skin, it's really tricky because people have eliminated so much in this effort to try to uh, eliminate a trigger. They think food is like the last tool that they possibly could utilize. And this is where, you know, this kind of conversation is happening because we need to make sure to tend to this garden inside of us. You have to, and this is part of that process. So I wanted to talk a little bit about histamine intolerance because I love that you actually not only mentioned this in the book, but it's a really intelligent conversation that is A, interesting to me at a clinical level, 
<laughs> but also, I think it would be very relatable and um, understandable to somebody who doesn't have the level of knowledge and clinical experience that I have. And it does happen. Like, I love that you were just like, OK, uh, chocolate is fermented, which is true. That's one of the reasons it's the highest domain food. Uh, Alcohol is a problem, but fermented foods are a problem. Like you really laid it out and you were br brutally honest about here's the foods that are going to be problematic. And then went into this whole discussion on DAO, diamine oxidase, which is a really important enzyme within the GI tract. So. I wanted to ask you some questions about that because I think it might be interesting for people to hear from your perspective being a gastroenterologist, this concept of where DAO comes into the picture because we have a lot of people that are struggling with histamine intolerance. Um, and it and I kind of describe it more as histamine overload. Like we've got people who are struggling with chronic hives who have a more histamine picture and st are struggling with eczema. So. What's the deal with DAO and and how does that relate to fiber? All right, so um, it's a let's, big question. Yeah. <laughs> a lot to unpack. Yeah. Oh uh, let, so let's 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 paint a picture here. All right. So histamine intolerance is when your body is out of balance and there's an excess of histamine relative to your body's ability to break down the, the histamine. And the, the, the principal enzyme that does the breaking down of the histamine is DAO. And I, I would I would paint a picture almost like let's like go game the Game of Thrones style here and pretend we have this medieval castle. All right. And you're up in the you're up in the white ivory tower. Right. And we want to keep you safe. And so outside the castle, there's a castle wall and there is an army that is protecting you. That's DAO. And then here comes the invading barbarians, which is the histamine. Right. And they're trying to come in and overrun the castle. So DAO is the enzyme that breaks things down. It neutralizes the invading army, with it, which is the histamine. But also your gut barrier is the castle wall. Your gut barrier, when intact, is part of your defense against histamine intolerance. And people who have histamine intolerance, I would argue probably the main reason why they are manifesting this is not just the absence of DAO, but instead, it is the injury that has taken place to the gut barrier, which leaves them vulnerable because you're supposed to have this protective mechanism and it's no longer in place. So what can we do? Well, we basically have three choices because we actually have command over this entire this entire battlefield. We can actually reduce the barbarians that are invading. We have the ability to actually take them off the battlefield because we choose how much histamine is in our diet. Now, there will always be histamine in our diet. There's no such thing as a zero histamine diet. All foods have histamine. But through smart, sensible choices, we have the ability to basically affect that and we could potentially reduce that. At the same time, we have the ability to basically pump up our DAO levels so we can reinforce the army that's protecting our castle. One of the coolest ways to do this is through sprouting. This is how we get to sprout. We talked about this beforehand. Okay, let's 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 do it. I I'm, I was going to ask you about this, but I'm so glad you brought it up. Okay, let's let's do it. So, sprouting to me is like if you're not sprouting, you need to be, because it is it is easy to do. It is wildly inexpensive. It is the most nutritious food. I mean, like literally this is, you are growing a garden on your kitchen counter and you are eating it as fresh as you could possibly eat a food right out of the garden. But it does not require any soil. It is not dirty. You can part purchase organic. I'm talking about, by the way, seeds and legumes that we're gonna sprout. So you can purchase organic and because you're buying it in bulk, it's actually really inexpensive. So like imagine buying like 10 pounds of legumes, right? And you're gonna sprout these guys and 10 pounds of legumes might run you 25 bucks, right? And that 10 pounds of legumes is gonna last you months. Um, so now here's what's cool about sprouting. Sprouting can actually, and it, but at baseline, it enhances the nutritional value of the food. It cranks up the fiber, it cranks up the protein, it reduces anti-nutrient content and increases vitamins. Um, I think the minerals actually increase, which I don't fully understand how that even happens, but they do. And then there are these medicinal properties to sprouts. 
And here's an example of where you will find medicinal properties. DAO, this enzyme that helps us to break down histamine in our own body, actually exists as a part of legume sprouts. So when you sprout a legume, any legume, you are creating DAO. And our research indicates, they actually have studies, they can, they're cited in my book, our research indicates that peas are the ones that produce the most DAO. And here's what's interesting. It's not just like sprouting peas. You actually want to stress the peas out, like stress them out. Okay. Because when you challenge them and you sprout them in the dark, you bring out the best in them. So, so what does that mean? So like you like put it in the cupboard? You can put them in the cupboard. You could take the bot, like you could take the sprouting jar that you have and wrap it in aluminum foil so that it stays dark. All right. So, but basically, by making the sp the peas sprouted in the dark, you are actually cranking up the DAO production. They actually become even more active. Now, why that is, what what that means in terms of nature <laughs> signals, I don't really understand. I'll just be honest. But it's, okay. it's really cool to imagine. You're sitting down to have a meal. You have histamine intolerance, and you could actually reduce the likelihood of having a flare of your histamine intolerance by quite simply eating pea sprouts. And I know people are going to ask, is there a certain amount that you would recommend per meal? Because I, you know, there are DAO supplements. I found they're like, honestly, hit or miss. Most of the time don't really help that much. Um, but the pea sprout thing was something that popped up that we found, but we couldn't find a whole lot of information about it. So this is really helpful. Yeah. So I think what you do is you, you do a, a, a self-guided, a self-guided self um, assessment of the value of these pea sprouts where, you know, you basically like you test it, not necessarily with a super high histamine meal, but you start with a low histamine meal and you add the pea sprouts and then you start to challenge yourself with more and more histamine in your food while simultaneously maintaining the pea sprouts and seeing where it takes you. And, you know, this is effectively, um, you're going to adjust the dose in terms of what you need based upon your ability to minimize your symptoms. So that's the way that I would approach that. Okay. And I will share. So I wish now I had my jar of sprouts. Literally, it's like ready to go into the fridge. Everyone, it is so easy. I was so paranoid and afraid to do it before. I don't know why. It is so much cheaper. They last like, I don't know, two weeks as opposed to three days before getting slimy. They are fresher. You, I give some to my mom. Like it is so easy to do. You can do this. I'll try and see if I can link to one of my tutorials. Sprout, just start doing it. And it's fun for kids. It, it like it takes me four or five days on the countertop and then I've got a whole jar. Um, so please, please consider doing this. It's an awesome thing. And I love that you know about this and that oh, you're talking about this is just so great. In, in the Fiber Fields cookbook, we have an entire chapter about sprouts and it's literally just to teach people how to do it. So great. And, um, you know, it's cool. Like you take a half of a cup of lentil sprouts, half a cup of lentils. Not the lentils you're buying at your store. You get special sprouting lentils, but like a half a cup in three days turns into four cups of sprouted lentils. I mean, it's insane. Wow. And then if you like flavor, you need to try onion sprouts. Oh, onion sprouts? oh my gosh. Like one of the coolest tasting foods and you've never tasted it before. But when you sprout onions, now it takes a while. It takes like literally about 10 days to sprout onions. So it's a more heavy investment of time just in terms of maintaining that consistency of the sprouting because it's twice a day you got to do this. But when you get to that finish line, once you've had onion sprouts, you're going to start putting them in everything, on everything. <laughs> it becomes a garnish for every, like you figure out a way to get one onion sprouts in because they're just a total game changer. And remember everyone, you don't cook I could be wrong. You could tell tell me if I'm wrong, but you don't cook sprouts. You eat them raw. Yeah, I eat them raw. Well, because because part of what you're getting are these enzymes, right? So like this DAO is there because it's an enzyme that's a part of this germination process that's taking place in the plant. So we're, we're basically catching the plant in this like magical early moment where like nature is basically like trying to give it everything it can to um, to grow and to thrive. And we, we get to consume it. It's fair game.
Yeah, I love that. So I did want to mention too, in your your cookbook, you have this wonderful page, and I don't know what page it's going to end up being on in the book, but um, in my copy, you had listed, which thank you for doing this, because I have cited other websites, but there are medications that can be associated with this issue with DAO. Do you find that it's that the medica- certain medications, I mean, it's like, these are some of these are pretty common medications. Um, ibuprofen, um, I'm just looking at morphine, naproxen, uh, there are certain non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs. Um, so do you find that it's that what I have read is that they seem to deplete or block the production of DAO? Is that what your research says? Just and not to scare anyone, but just to just an FYI, there are meds out there that can have an impact on this. Well, I think, you know, look, at the end of the day, first of all, I think that the best form of healthcare is where we rather than like being all Western healthcare or all alternative we instead are integrating the best of both worlds where like we're we're acknowledging the importance of diet and lifestyle and these other elements that can be done as a preventative mechanism and then simultaneously when you need medication you need medication and sometimes people need medication right, right. right so when you need the medication you need the medication but that doesn't stop us from asking the question do i need this medication and it's actually quite shocking how often you can approach your doctor and ask that question and they don't really know whether you do or you don't and if that's the case, then it makes you really wonder whether you do, because maybe you should come off of it. So I think creating awareness and empowerment around this idea where I don't want people struggling with histamine intolerance and not realizing that maybe there's something that could have been done with the help of their healthcare provider to make an adjustment in terms of what medications they're taking to reduce the likelihood of having these issues. Yeah, I appreciate that answer very much because I am, I I think everybody's journey is different, but I think, like you said, when we start asking why, is this necessary? And why am I taking, or why do I feel like I need, for example, ibuprofen all the time? Should I start, and you know, we could go into the whole thing of what NSAIDs do to the GI tract and could potentially cause ulcers and all sorts of other things. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a really valid question to ask. And I love that we're having, this is just a great conversation. Even though I know everyone, this isn't like skin specific, it is related. And I know that for those of you who've listened, I mean, we're 200 some episodes in at this point, you know how important gut health is. And that's why I really wanted to have this conversation to help invite you all into the space where you could become inspired to begin integrating in even new veggies at the grocery store. And I think this is a great resource to help you do that because food should be fun. And if you're not sprouting, maybe this is the call to action to do that. That could be like your one next step that you take. But I think this is a great book for everybody to check out. And no matter where you are, it doesn't matter whether you are more on the plant-based side or you eat a very varied diet and you're just looking to integrate more plants into your diet, or maybe you're just like starting. (laughs) This is awesome. So um, thank you so much, Dr. B, for being here. Um, I guess everybody can get your book at most um, most stores, right? It's available pretty much going to be everywhere, I would assume. So yes, my book is going to be available everywhere. I mean, you can, of course, go to the traditional avenues um, like Amazon or whatever it may be. My my one uh, ask or challenge to the, to the listeners, if you feel inspired and motivated to check out my book, um, is that we're emerging from this pandemic and like imagine what this has been like for your local bookstore. <laughs> um, they're lucky if they're still open and most likely the owners are your neighbors, right? This is someone that lives in your community, not someone who's mega rich through the wires of the internet. And so if it's my choice, like I'm grateful to anyone who orders my book, no matter how you do. But if it's my choice, I would really encourage you to take the time to go to that local bookshop, grab the book there, and that way you're handing that money over to your neighbor and you know thanking them for keeping their doors open despite the pandemic, because it's been a crazy time. Yeah, I can very much appreciate that. So you've got the Fiber Fueled book. We've now got the Fiber Fueled cookbook. That's what we've been talking about today. And then if you want to go check out what Dr. B is doing and stay in touch with him, he's got the Plant Fed Gut. Dot com And he's got a really great Instagram as well. I'm going to link to everything in the show notes. So it's really easy for you to find 
But thank you so much, Dr. B, for being here. I really appreciate this. I know you got one more thing. What's what do you want to share? Well, I just wanted to re I just wanted to to um, reinforce and say that like in my book, literally the first words, if you open up the book to the very first page, it says, with humility, I have discovered that no two of us are exactly the same. So I just really want to encourage everyone that like I, you're on your own personal journey. And the way that I see this book is like, to me, this is not meant to really truly be a cookbook, although it is. It's actually really truly meant to be a tool that you can apply to your own life in whatever way you feel is best for you. You're on your own journey. I am just trying to create a resource that's there to support you on that journey. So no matter who you are, if you have food intolerances, like I honestly think this book is the probably like gold standard book for food intolerances. It has two recipe based protocols. One of them is low histamine. One of them is low FODMAP to teach you about these things. Um, I give you the entire methodology. I teach you how to sprout. I teach you how to ferment. Basically, I'm putting the tools on the table and I want you to apply them to your own life and whatever you feel works best for you. And my my dream is that one day we're all on this journey and then we emerge from the forest into the same place together and we're just all celebrating and we're having fun because we found great health and it happened through this this journey through you know gut health and um and that food brings us great joy that's ultimately where i want everyone to be yay i love those parting thoughts thank you so much and i hope that you can come back sometime i feel like we have so much more we could yeah, talk about we <laughs> <laughs> we're just getting started um, but Yes, absolutely. And I wish you the best of the luck with the book. I'm excited to dive into it when it finally does come out. I can't wait to get a copy and I'm going to check out the Sprout. Like I have to dive more. You've, you're encouraging me, me now and inspiring me to dive more into Sprouts. And now maybe I need to start fermenting. Okay. But I'll, I'll use, I'll follow your lead. So uh, real quick, <laughs> real quick, real quick, parting yeah. shots, fermentation. New study, new study came out out of Stanford University. Some of my friends actually, professors Christopher Gardner and Justin Sonnenberg, less than a year ago. And they found that when they increased fiber, uh, I'm sorry, fermented food consumption, in 10 weeks, people had a significant increase in the diversity of their gut microbiome, which basically means a healthier gut, and reduced measures of inflammation. This is directly applicable to the listeners of this audience. Uh, yes. or to the to the listeners of this show. Um, yes. So, and then the other thing that I wanted to add real quick is that when it comes to sprouting, we talked about lentil sprouts, we talked about pea sprouts, broccoli sprouts might be the healthiest food on the entire planet. Yes. And then we talked about the onion sprouts. Jen, if you haven't tried them, that might be the new frontier for you. I have yeah. to do this now. They're so good. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're a wealth of knowledge. Like I said, I, we, we'll have to figure out another time to have you come back and dive more into this. I think people would love it. Um, and I'm excited for your book. So congratulations. And we'll have you back sometime. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, hanging with us today. I actually really enjoyed the fiber fueled cookbook. It's one of the few times where I enjoyed a cookbook because he actually put a lot of great information into this book. That's why I wanted to have this conversation and Dr. B on the show. I'm sure you guys love this. And this was just a tidbit of what I found in his book. All of the resources we talked about and links for Dr. B along with your We'll just say easy way to grab copies of his book can be found over at skintorup.com forward slash 245. There you can also leave questions and comments so we can keep the conversation going. And if you haven't done so yet, please rate and review The Healthy Skin Show. It means a ton not only to me, but to the people who are looking at those reviews, deciding whether the show offers them some insight that they haven't yet found elsewhere. And then make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a weekly dose of insightful conversations, research, alternative strategies, and tips to help you rebuild healthy skin. And then let's connect over on social media. I'm at Jennifer Fugo. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.